Hi, today we're going to talk about cellular automata. Uh, the singular of cellular automata, by the way, is a cellular automaton. So we're going to look at a cellular automaton, but we're going to discuss cellular automata. Now, <laughs> why? First of all, what is a cellular automaton, and why are we looking at this? Okay, so first of all, you know, you might be just arriving here from nowhere, which is totally fine, but if you had just watched the previous video, the last thing we talked about is right here behind me, a flocking system, a complex system, a system of many simple agents that when they work together exhibit this, um, exhibit this complex intelligent behavior. So th there's a lot going on in this system. There's physics, there's there's physics, there's motion, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, the neighborhoods are changing as these things move about the space. One of the reasons to look at cellular auto automata is to say, OK, now that we achieved this complex system, let's boil that down and try to create the simplest possible complex system ever. <laughs> what would that be? What is the simplest possible agent which would have the simplest possible neighbors and the simplest possible set of rules as to how it interacts with its neighbors. If we could design that system, could we still achieve complexity? So that's the question we want to answer when looking at cellular automata. <laughs> now, what is one? Well, OK, first of all, so these videos, we're, gonna, we're basically going to talk through the, the two classic examples. And we're going to do them in reverse chronological order, but our order is going to have some logic to it. So I'm just going to move. So we're going to go through um, two uh, kind of classic cellular automatons, automata. Ah! This one is uh, scrolling here by, this is the Wolfram Elementary CA, and this is rule 30? 30? <laughs> it is, in fact, this is rule 30, which we're going to get to. What does rule 30 even mean? This is, oh, uh, so um, we're going to talk about Wolfram in a little bit. Over here, we have something called the game of life, which is perhaps the most famous, uh, or certainly the, the first most famous cellular automata that, um, uh, that, that sort of arrived into popular culture with a, with a well known article in 1970 in Scientific American. So we're going to look at these two systems, understand how they work, understand how to write the code for them, and then ask the question, <laughs> you know, great, we could just implement these and change the colors and we have some interesting patterns, but really we need to ask the question, how does this way of thinking apply to the type of work we're doing in interactive media, computer graphics, computational design, all that sort of stuff. So hopefully this video is going to kind of introduce the concepts behind these two systems, and the next couple videos will um, walk through the code for them, and the last video will kind of talk about uh, other, other possibilities in this realm. <laughs> okay, do we feel good about that? I feel good about that, that, yes. So let's talk about, let's define, let's just say CA. Let's define a CA. Okay, let's define a cellular automaton. A cellular automaton is a grid of cells. We're going to look at one-dimensional grids, two-dimensional grids. A one-dimensional grid, for example, just looks like this. Here are a whole bunch of cells sitting next to each other in one dimension, which incidentally looks quite a bit like the diagram for an array. So we can see how this is going to fit nicely in terms of programming these types of things. OK, now, if a C CA is a grid of cells, each cell is defined by as a entity that has a state, and we're going to look at a variety of possible states, the simplest being a 0 or a 1, right? a binary state. It's on or off, alive or dead, 0 or 1, black or white. And each cell also has a neighborhood. This is very important because how a, state, a cell's state changes over time is going to be determined by the the, the sum, the, 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 by analyzing its neighbor state. So this is really the third aspect of defining a CA, which is that the state of a cell, a cell state at any moment in time, t, is equal to a function of the neighborhood states at time t minus 1. So we have this idea of generations, generations over time. The CA has a whole bunch of states if they're 0 or 1s. And then we say, hey, at the next moment in time, this state cell is somehow going to be calculated based on a neighborhood of states. Adding them together, averaging them, say what is the pattern, that type of thing. So this is how we define a CA. Great. <laughs> 
So I think this actually, strangely, I'm trying different things, wraps up this video. I, and I, I guess I'll give you an exercise, which is kind of a bit of an insane one. But uh, you know, mo many of you watching this or might be familiar with this already. Um, many of you watching this might have never heard of a CA before. If you haven't, try to design for yourself a set of rules for how cell states would change over time for a one-dimensional CA with zeros and ones. Now this is, of course, what we're going to look at in the next video. The next video we're going to look at the Wolfram Elementary CA, which is precisely this. A one-dimensional CA where the states are zeros and ones, and we're going to look at what are, what's a possible set of rules for how those states change from generation to generation? How do we implement that in code, and what results do we get? But you know, it's a little exercise to yourself. You might try imagining this. OK, so I'm going to pause here, and I'm just going to keep plowing through, and, but the, oh, the next stuff will be in another video. How, how do you feel about that? Great. OK, thanks. <laughs>